Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about uh, Profiles in Excellence uh, 2020. Scott, let me jump it over to you. I'd like to you to discuss uh, your best accomplishments. You guys have a, a very unique situation there. You know, you're striped across a lot of federal agencies. I'd like you to point out, uh, you know, a, 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 a program success that you've seen in one of these agencies that you'd like to uh, spotlight for us that has been accomplished this year. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things. So, you know, many of you have talked about uh, sort of, you know, how how you were able to sort of survive through the COVID-19 and really shutting off uh, work from home or shutting, you know, turning work from home on, um, which was really a big accomplishment for us uh, as an IT team. Uh, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, we, we got the call on March 12th, send everybody home, 6,000 employees are gone. Uh, working from home, working with the security and things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say, you know, how important it is for us to all have these types of disaster preparedness plans and actually make them work. I would, I would say with regards to, uh, you know, how we're working with various federal agencies and, and public sector agencies, you know, one of the things that we've been able to accomplish is really a, a provisional authorization on IL-4. Uh, you know, which is really going to make a big deal for anybody that's wanting to use our ITSM uh, platforms and any other products that uh, that really, you know, are beneficial to the federal and public sector uh, markets. Um, you know, many of you use our products uh, with regards to Control M, ITSM, and, and many of the automation capabilities that we have. Um, so, you know, it, it's hard to highlight a specific uh, project, but I would say that this is a milestone for BMC, and really, um, it, it's going to take us to the next level. You know, in working with the federal government, really enabling um, all the different agencies uh, with regards to our our solutions. Yeah, you know, it's really important that uh, um, any time that we're going to lean on this type of technology to enable some of these capabilities that have been described there. We want to make sure it's hardened. We want to make sure it's certified. We want to make sure it's uh, credentialed at the highest level, right? That's a, certainly very important to, to, to have that capability available and, and, and have a level of confidence there when they're going to use that type of capability. Greg, let me, let me throw it over to you. Uh, you all play, a, uh, once again, a key role in it as, as the, uh, the various CIOs are describing these capabilities that they've been able to roll out and uh, not only to enable sort of this new operating environment, but enable, you know, all the capability on top of that operating environment. You guys play a big role in that. I'd like you to just uh, give us a highlight of, of an agency, if you will. You know, again, once again, you're another agency or another partner that's striped across a lot of agencies, private sector included, yep. uh, that uh, you'd like to highlight and shine a spotlight on for us. Yeah, thanks, Luke. And uh, really honored to be on the program today. You know, one thing I'd like to do is really kind of focus on the, the challenge in the industry that we go after. And you, and you look at the, the world we live in today, software and applications is really the way that drives the world, right? So if you start thinking about how our daily lives, both professionally and personally, it's all based on software and applications. And the key part here is that these applications have to be very easy to use. They have to be very, uh, they have to perform at, at top-notch capabilities of what the user is expecting, and it has to be available 24-7 a day. So you think about, you think about the, the application on the user side, and you look at the way IT has transformed over the last decade. You think 10 years ago, we, we had a single data center that everything was running in. We had control over. You started to introduce cloud services, and now you started to get this complex architecture for the application space. So on one hand, you have a very simple to use application. On the other hand, you now have a, a, an environment or an IT department or that, is, that is running hybrid, on-premise, some cloud, maybe full cloud. But the challenge to be able to figure out what's going wrong with these applications has gone up tremendously. So where you know, AppDynamics has been helping our, uh, the agencies, you know, a lot of folks on the call today too, is around giving you that, that full stack visibility or observability of the application stack so that you can see every step along the way where there's a challenge with that particular app. You know, the other piece too is, you know, as the pandemic hit, uh, you know, software really helped us get through the pandemic or, or working through the pandemic for that matter. But the, uh, the whole idea is here that folks are being 
have a tremendous amount of pressure and they need to have that context of what's going on wrong with their applications. So by AppDynamics giving that full stack observability enables our, our agencies to be able to go and quickly define and find out root cause of the application issue, be able to resolve it many cases before the end user population starts to see that there's an issue with the application. And then also knocking down the silos within IT so that you know traditionally folks would, would focus only on the network or only on the infrastructure, or only on the database. But by giving that full uh, sense of truth to be able to lower the, the mean time to resolution is really where we've been helping our agencies to, to succeed with their missions. Yeah, you know, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, that, that capability has to just absolutely be there, right? Uh, resiliency, continuity of government, availability to the veterans, to the you know, name your mission, right? Uh, super important. Nick, let's throw it over to you. Pure storage, same situation there. Uh, lots of capability out there that are being enabled uh, to, to, to sort of allow us to operate in this, uh, this new model, if you will, this certainly cloud smart model. Uh, give us an example of something you'd like to highlight there. Sure. I think that, uh, you know, over the course of the past year, well, I want to thank every CIO and leader on this call for your tremendous efforts and support of the United States during this extraordinary time. Um, and Jim, as a veteran and customer of yours, I'm deeply pleased to see the continued improvement on the evolution of the customer facing services in support of the VA's digital services. It's, it's been cool to watch and fun to use. It's working. Um, we saw, you know, last year um, was proof of the concept that, you know, what happens when preparedness meets opportunity. And it's the culmination of, you know, as some have said previously, about 20 years worth of work. You know, there's four things that kind of drive organizational dynamics in the IT space. And it's, you know, people, process, policy, and technology. And technology is easy. Uh, but the policies and the thought processes of the, the leaders and the staffs uh, in terms of the comfort and adopting and the ability to adopt uh, external services and utility computing services and just making that de rigueur has been hugely transformational. And then having the acquisition vehicles necessary to be able to move the money, also incredibly important. And I think one of the fundamental things that drove our comfort in doing that in government and, and from the, the vendor side, understanding what we had to deliver uh, was FedRAMP. So if we can provide commercial services that meet the government security criteria, it solves a huge problem in terms of adoption. Now, the other thing that we saw was, um, you know, uh, I want to I want to give a very special shout out in the two key areas that, that we uh, we were able to support the government, but most especially the agencies, uh, the Department of Energy has been undergoing a, tre a tremendous uh, infrastructure transformation, particularly out in the national laboratories. And we saw an adoption and, a and an insertion of a complete enterprise data center uh, infrastructure at DOE in about six weeks. And we're talking a, you know, multiple dozen petabytes worth of storage that went in and out, the, the net effect of which was a 90% reduction in power space and cooling consumption a 10x improvement in their overall performance and service efficiency, and the elimination of all of their sustainment technical debt for that infrastructure. It was breathtaking. In my experience, that takes 18 to 36 months to accomplish. And the Sandia National Labs team did it in less than three weeks. So it was, you know, 10 racks worth of equipment removed, one rack of equipment in place, and a sudden and extraordinary improvement in the operational services at a critical time for the department as they were resourcing not only obviously their usual scientific and energy research, but uh, making themselves available for the pursuit of COVID solutions and virology and lever you know, enabling other agencies to leverage their extraordinary supercomputing capability um, to solve an immediate emergency challenge for the United States. So that was number one. The second one, and I'm going to cheat because this was a tie, the Department of the Navy about two years ago embarked on a endeavor to create an artificial intelligence as a service platform at Naval Surface Warfare Crane. And it was specifically focused around uh, AI and cybersecurity applications. But what they did was rather than keep that in-house and, and you know, hug their data silo, they released it on a service catalog to the, ent the entire Department of the Navy. And the catalog is actually accessible by the entire DOD. So they, they set themselves up as an AI and machine learning ops as a service component 
uh, that the entire DOD can leverage, but very importantly for the DOD, on their own networks. So using their own data on their own networks, there's a, there's a tremendous willingness and growing willingness across the departments to share the technology investments that they're making and make them available as a service to other components and other agencies. And that, that's really cool because my theory has long been that the government's probably the largest cloud in the world. And now you're starting to see the government agencies act like service providers, even within the U.S. government's own infrastructure. I, I can't tell you how pleased I am to, to hear these stories. Well, I want to uh, roll over into a, a different type of question. I've been uh, really looking forward to this. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is about leadership, right? And I'm, Rocky, I'm going to start with you. And uh, just, you know, as a leader in your agency, right, as an executive of the agency there, and uh, can you just discuss, you know, sort of leading through this situation that you were in, right? A lot of uncertainty, particularly in the beginning with your employees, your own personal situation, all the, all the uh, capability that you had to have available for the entire energy sector, right, et cetera. You know, what, what does that look like? And then what were you leaning on most? What did you find yourself? Where did you find the strength and, you know, the, 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 the things that you found yourself sort of leaning on the most? Uh, you know, if you say what I'm leaning on the most or the personal answer and then there's the professional answer. So of course, you know, family, you know, community um, and, and, and that type of thing is what you really lean on day to day. But when you talk about professionally, what do you lean on? What do you lean on to lead people? Um, and it starts with, I used to work for a gentleman named Secretary Bodman, uh, Department of Energy, it's about 2007 and eight. And he had his 10 guiding principles. Um, and, and I came in, I talked about my guiding principles, but the one that always um, sticks out is, well, there's two of them. One, treat everyone with dignity and respect. And the other one is, in, in the end, always do the right thing. But you rely on kind of your guiding principles. And those are some of them. When I, when I talk to my team, it's, I'm a management by walking around guy. I like to walk the halls and I like to say hi to people. Can't do that right now. Um, right. So, you kind of do that by, I, I call it the random phone call, um, calling the GS 13 or 14 in the middle of the day and saying, how you doing? What's going on? What works? What doesn't? Um, but, but really what that's all about is you care about people, right? And so I, I talk to the team a lot. We talk about leadership in this environment where people are working hard and people are, are kind of focusing on the mission. Um, you know, I, I always say to people, look, uh, caring about people is not in our professional it's not in our professional PD, right? Um, you know, no one has, you know, maintain the network, you know, ensure cybersecurity, care about people, right? It doesn't say that in your PD. I go, but it is our, it is in our PD for life, right? As a member of the human race, we need to care about people. So uh, tell everyone, check in on each other as we work remotely. You're not seeing them every day. If you know somebody is living alone, especially in the early days of quarantine, make sure we check in on them. Uh, so it was a lot of focusing on people, focusing on caring about one another. And um, I know it might sound a little kumbaya, but it, it is what it is, right? Uh, and then, as always, when you get on the call, it's, you make sure everyone focuses on the mission. Um, but none of that gets done without, you know, just the the day-to-day -day human kind of interactions and, and saying, how are you doing? What can we do to help? And just checking in. Fantastic. Uh, yes, job one, uh, making sure that uh, the troops are okay. Jim, how about you? Same question. You know, you, again, you had to sort of pull on that strength and uh, sort of work your way through all this uncertainty. Well, what would you find yourself doing uh, in regards to sort of uh, leading through that uncertainty and unknown? Yeah, I think um, part of it's just getting organized, right? We, we certainly learned it with Mission Act last year. It's and I think uh, one of our colleagues here mentioned up front is, you know, uh, you, we used a team of teams approach, right? Uh, and, and, you know, getting, uh, getting organized across 10 different scrum teams. So, you know, kind of on the organizational side, put someone in charge, focus the efforts, but put the teams in, in, in scrum and work stream format, um, you know, meet repetitively throughout the day. Uh, you know, uh, so, so I think, again, we, we fell back on that best practice and we we're able to deliver fast in terms of uh, the capabilities that the department needs. I, th I think the other thing too is right. It's very easy uh, for us to look back retrospectively here on uh, the past eight months and then you know kind of pop the champagne cork a little bit. But you know there were some pretty scary times back there in March and April. I think for a lot of folks, 
Uh, you know, I was I was certainly stressing out over how am I going to provision an environment where only about 60,000 people are teleworking and be prepared to support up to 400,000, right? And so uh, part of it too, though, is, uh, you know, caring for our teams, a lot easier said than done. You know, uh, a lot of IT professionals are able to uh, go to remote work. Uh, 3,100 of our 8,000 workforce in OIT um, is in end user operations. They are supporting the 170 medical centers, the 56 benefits regional offices and the 140 cemeteries. They can't go home. They were on the front line. I tell you what, we had uh, understandably scared uh, staff members, uh, especially in the early days of COVID. So we did everything we could to build and maintain that confidence, you know, uh, again, for the military guys out, out here and gals, you know, it's you know, battlefield circulation. That's why I'm in St. Petersburg today to, to do the town hall and meet face to face with both the business and our teammates. But, but again, building that confidence, showing that resilience, uh, and then working through the problem sets, you know, on, on that very agile and, and scrum methodology, that team of teams approach. Uh, very focused on the mission. And once again, focused on those employees, et cetera, uh, key element, key tenement here. Uh, Karen, how about you? Uh, what, what, what did you lean on there, right? You're actually in a unique situation. You're actually in two different departments during this process at the beginning of it and certainly now. So I, I appreciate uh, the comments that are coming from my, my uh, colleagues here because it is about the people. So I think to your point, Luke, it's a unique situation for myself coming into a virtual environment and then building the team approach in a virtual environment and being a new leader and trying to have that consistency and work at the CXO level and up right, then working down with the other component CIOs and then working within my own organization. So it, it is about the people. And I think Rocky said it uh, multiple times, but, you know, it's family first. And that was a principle that we talked about and that I made sure that we reinforced and that's reinforced by our leadership from the secretary all the way down. And so having that flexibility because of the environment that we're in and, and not saying, oh, people have to come to work. So I think what is also unique about this is, um, the people who had a transition because they were physically on-prem, when you come into a virtual environment like myself, and I had been working 10 years already out, and so working on initiatives, which by the way, you know, kudos to you, sir, for being the US Cyber Challenge lead, right? You're working already in a virtual environment. And so bringing those skill sets and bringing them in to get the team going, the technology allows you, you're not constrained by a conference room anymore. So some of these meetings that you normally would just have your XDs on or the you know, SESs or just the CIOs, you can expand out so that people are hearing from you personally and not uh, what I call whisper down the lane translations, right? And so they get to hear the information directly. So we have been, normally they would have all hands quarterly. We're having the monthly and our CXOs are actively participating in each other's all hands meeting. And that partnership um, in this virtual environment really uh, sends a clear message out to all the workforce uh, because Rocky hit that piece also is all the services that DHS has, like checking on somebody who you know is by themselves. Or for example, my team has to travel with the secretary, making sure that they have the right resources and that there is a surveillance program in place with them because they go back to their families. And so do we have the right medical program in place for them? And that, you know, when one of them tests positive, that we can rotate people through and readjusting our resources for those types of things. So those were the first things that I had to put in place, but there are benefits because they get to hear from you and you can expand out how you're interacting with the workforce in a virtual environment. Yeah, really key there. Uh, I didn't even think about, you know, the folks on the front line and then coming back into their homes and having to, to manage. Exactly. Very, very good point there. All right, exactly. we're going to take... We're going to take another short break and we're going to be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 